Hey guys, thanks for joining me for this 73rd episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests in this episode include actor and producer Yugi Okumoto. He's got a new movie, The Paper Tigers, which is available on Friday. We'll also visit with best-selling author Mark Sullivan. His new novel, The Last Green Valley, is available today. We'll also visit with award-winning director Kevin McDonald. The movie The Mauritanian is available on demand, on Blu-ray, and digital download coming up on May 11th. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, check out the shop, and of course, share with your friends. Now it's time to do something maybe you didn't do last year, or the year before, or ever. But yes, they do claim it's important. As we head into the middle of spring, now is a good time to reverse the direction of your ceiling fans. Now the blades are tilted at an angle for a reason. They should spin clockwise in the winter to pull quarter air up from the floor. That way it mixes with the warm air near the ceiling and keeps you warmer. Now in spring and summer, they should spin counterclockwise to push the air down so it blows on you and keeps you cool. Now if you've never changed them before, there's usually a black switch on the side of the fixture. Just make sure and clean the blades first because they're probably covered in dust which will go everywhere. Of course, if you've never changed them over the winter, congratulations, you're already done. I take it, my memories of him back to uh, Karate Kid Part 2. We've got Yuji Akimoto on the line with us and got a new movie to talk about, The Paper Tiger. And first off, Yuji, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Cameron. Did it. I, uh, hey, I want to say a shout out to OKC. Well, appreciate that. And uh, tell us uh, how excited you are about The Paper Tiger that is uh, on demand and available in theaters uh, coming up on the 7th. Uh, new movie, producing, and, and making a cameo as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite the transition from actor to producer. I've been an actor for uh, my life. And so, you know, the, I guess the big difference from being an actor to a producer is that you know, as an actor, you just deliver your performance and you're done for the day. As a producer, you're, you're grinding every single day and every single hour and it, uh, from pre-production to principal photography, post-production, selling your film and marketing. So, uh, you know, I, I learned so much about all producing. Uh, the one thing I, I share is that you know, for anything to happen, it takes a village to have, have the support system in place. Hats off to all the people that supported the film to get us to this point. And, and you talked about how much different it is going behind the scenes, and, and how much uh, did you under uh, appreciate what expectations are there for the producer as well? Uh, a lot. <laughs> a lot. You know, we a lot of you know, challenges, and I think the biggest challenge for, for me as a raising the money were all the producers on this film came from the creative side of the business. So raising money is not an easy thing, especially <laughs> nowadays. So went from all kind of personal videos, talking about who we are, creations, kind of crowdsourcing. Uh, quite the journey. Now, what, did, what is the biggest thing that you, what was the biggest uh, technical issue you had to deal with this last year, especially without having to be face-to-face -face with folks? How, how much tech savvy did you have to get this year? Well, uh, I'm uh, tech illiterate, so uh, <laughs> that job didn't fall on me. I think my kids are, are better tech people than, than I am, uh, but uh, the, I think the biggest roadblock, the biggest issue was... Uh, even post production, when we talk about the, this shutdown, thought you know we'd save some some money by going across the border to uh, Vancouver, Canada, to finish our post production and color correcting and sound sweetening. Uh, but then the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, our film was kind of stuck there, and they then they they shut the borders, to Canada, so we couldn't even sit in front of a monitor with them and listen to the sound of the person. So that's what was really difficult because we're sending notes back and back and forth. Never quite right. <laughs> so uh, once the 
Canada opened up a, a little bit, then uh, we took the opportunity to send the director immediately there, <laughs> so he got a chance to kind of do the finishing touches on on the, all the post production. That that was crazy. That was the uh, toughest part, I think. Now, UG, if folks haven't had the chance to see the trailer or the, heard any of the previews, tell our listeners just a little bit about The Paper Tiger. Sure. Uh, the, the Paper Tigers uh, stars uh, Ron Yuan, Elaine Wee, and uh, Michelle Shannon Jenkins as uh, the Tigers. Uh, it's a story of kung, three kung fu prodigies who have fallen out, uh, who had a falling out, as, uh, but they have to come together many years later and after they find out their Sifu has been murdered. Uh, they're now shape, uh, middle-aged, um, now shuffling their dead-end jobs and dad duties and set, aside, set aside their differences, and, and now they have to go avenge the, the death of their master. So imagine these guys are one kick away from And for you to bring out not only the, uh, the, the, the competitive natures in folks, but also to bring out the humor. I mean, that's, that's one of the things we've heard so much about the film. To bring that humor out as well, to get folks laughing in the times we're living in, UG, how cool is that for you as well? Well, that's awesome. I, and I think that's a testament to our director and uh, our cast. Uh, you know, um, have a, a terrific um, actor who I failed to mention uh, named Matt Page and Matt Page, if you are familiar with that name, you'll know him from uh, Enter the Dojo, which uh, he stars as a character named Master Ken. So, uh, you know, having actors come on board and, and um, really brought it, a lot of the stuff they just threw out there on the day and improv and they, they brought it. And so uh, pleased and proud of uh, performances and proud of the final outcome. Hopefully people enjoy it. That's right. And again, uh, The Paper Tiger, available on demand and in theaters coming up on Friday. And, UG, I always want to make sure and let folks know if they have any questions about uh, the movie, where they can find more information about that and uh, everything you got going social media-wise as well. Yeah, they can go to thepapertigersmovie.com. And uh, my handles are Twitter uh, at UG Okamoto and on IG at UG underscore Okamoto. All right. Well, Yuji, it has been great to visit with you this morning. I hope you have a great rest of your week and looking forward to the new movie. Thank you, Cameron. Appreciate the time. Now, even with more people than ever working right next to their kitchens, we still can't find a way to squeeze in breakfast. A new survey asked adults how often they skip breakfast, and one in four people said they skip it at least four times a week. Now, the main reasons people skip breakfast are they don't have time, there's nothing in the house they want to eat, and they get caught up doing other things. Now, the survey also asked people what time they run out of energy on the mornings where they skip breakfast, and the average time is 1026 a.m. Our next guest, uh, author, best-selling author, and got a new book releasing today to talk about. We've got Mark Sullivan on the line with us. And Mark, first off, appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, Cameron. Now, tell us where the inspiration behind the last Green Valley came. I mean, I know you were searching for a story and you found one. What uh, What was the, uh, the the light bulb moment for you, if you will? So I had published a book called uh, Beneath the Scarlet Sky that had done very well that was based on a true untold story of World War II, uh, the story of a 17-year-old boy who uh, leads Jews escaping Nazi-occupied Italy over the Alps into Switzerland and who then becomes a spy inside the German high command. And I was told by a lot of people I would never find another story like it that had the same kind of moving, healing inspiring and transformative qualities that Beneath the Scarlet Sky had. And I always thought I would. And sure enough, after the publication of the novel, uh, it's they started coming out of the woodwork, these stories, you know, people sending me letters and uh, emails, et cetera, and, you know, prompting me to look into this story or that story. And I realized I needed a criteria. What was I looking for? And I thought about Beneath and went right back to those four words, moving, healing, inspirational, transformative. 
And uh, I set out looking for that. And I didn't hear it until, of all places, I go and uh, do a talk on Beneath at the Noontime Rotary Club in Bozeman, Montana, where I live. Yeah, and a dentist comes up to me afterwards and he says, do you know these people, the Martells? And I said, you mean like the, the construction company? And he said, yeah. He said, the entire time I read Beneath the Scarlet Sky, I couldn't help but think of um, the Martell and the story of how they came to America. You need to hear it. So two days later, I put the, uh, the address for Bill Martell and the Navigator, and it's two miles from my house. And then it tells me to take this left into this older neighborhood, and I get a funky feeling. And it's because I'm only 200 yards, 250 yards from where I heard the story of Beneath the Scarlet Sky and Pino Lella. And so I go in, and Bill Martell starts telling me the story of this family of four, mom, dad, two young boys in a horse-drawn covered wagon on the run from the Soviet Red Army while under the protection of the Nazi SS in the last year of the war. And it's an adventure story. It's a love story. It's a, a, a profoundly disturbing story in many respects because of what they have to face and what they find out why the SS is protecting them. And it turns out that they are ethnic Germans, descendants of Germans who left Germany in the late 1790s at the behest of Catherine the Great, who offered them free land and tax-free life for 30 years if they would come and grow wheat for her. And they did and prospered in these colonies, and they had a great life until the communists took over, in, w in which case they were persecuted, sent to gulags, murdered, um, uh, you know, starved, thrown off their lands. And Hitler comes back and, and says, do you want your land back? And they say, sure. And they have about 18 months of the good life. And then Stalin's counterattacking. And unbeknownst to them, Heinrich Himmler, the architect of the final solution, wants the 130,000 ethnic Germans of Ukraine saved for reasons that they don't understand. And he orders that they be protected during the retreat. And what the reader does is goes on this retreat when they're caught between two armies, the German and the Soviet armies, and they're trying to flee with one goal in mind, that they're going to eventually leave the Germans as they go west, and they're going to get to the Western Allies' lines and make their way to freedom and a better life, which is symbolized to them by this idea of living in this beautiful green valley someday, surrounded by mountains and with a stream going through it. And this is what they cling to during this extraordinary journey that they have to overcome and finally triumph over. For you, Mark, to be able to share those stories and, and maybe at the beginning of it to find out that there still are those stories out there that have been untold. Is that is that what inspires you to keep writing and to keep working at the craft? It really does. Um, I find these stories to be incredibly inspirational myself. Um, they demonstrate the power of resilience and being willing to endure hardships, something I think which is lessons which are fantastic for today's current environment, given the pandemic, you know, knowing what human beings are capable of when the uh, when it really hits the fan, when it's life and death, when you have to make decisions based on there is no good decision. You have to make the decision that's the least worst. And I think we learn from these stories. And again, I get inspiration from them. And I believe that if I believe, if I get the inspiration, then readers will get it too. How many times were there times of where you were doubting whether this was the story or was it always just true to form? You knew it was uh, it, it had to be written. I knew it had to be written within an hour of hearing it. I, I could just tell it had those dimensions. You know, the big challenge was to bring it to life without making it so brutal that it would turn readers off. So that was a fine line. Um, if anything, I did cut back on what they saw and what they witnessed, uh, if only for the sake of readers, you know, mental health, you know, frankly, and my own. So um, they, but again, 
despite the ordeals, despite the obstacles they endured. And I found that incredibly inspiring to write. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't parts that were difficult. There were parts that were brutally difficult to write and to depict. But I found that by facing them head on, then you all of a sudden had a transition that happened and the drama went through the roof because you had real people feeling facing real life or death issues right in front of you on the page. And again, the uh, the last Green Valley is available now. And uh, Mark, I, I want to make sure and let our listeners know where to find more information, not only about uh, the last Green Valley, but uh, Beneath the Scarlet Sky and all the other works you've got going as well. Yeah, you could look at my website, which is MarkSullivanBooks.com. You can find me on Facebook and uh, subscribe to my newsletter at Mark Sullivan Author uh, on Instagram, Mark Sullivan 1981, and on Twitter, Mark Sullivan Author. All right. Well, Mark, it is always great to visit with you, sir. I appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule, and hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Cameron. Now, I thought this only happened with yawning, but I guess our tech is a natural extension of our anatomy now. When you see someone yawn, it tends to make you want to yawn, right? Well, a new study found the same thing also happens with our phones. Researchers in Italy wanted to see how many people would check their phone if they saw someone else check theirs. So they tried it with 184 people who didn't know they were being watched and half of them picked up their own phone within 30 seconds. Now, our first question was, well, don't a lot of us check our phone every 30 seconds anyway? But when people in the study didn't see someone check their phone, less than 1% picked up their own. Now, it's a phenomenon that they are calling the chameleon effect. Available on digital, on demand, and Blu-ray. On May 11th, the uh, Mauritanian. And from that, we've got director Kevin McDonald on the line with us today. And uh, first off, Kevin, thank you so much and excited to talk about this great movie. Great. It's really nice to be here with you today. Now, Kevin, tell us what the uh, what the pitch was for you when you first uh, had the opportunity to read about the Mauritanian and, and how gripping that was to you as well. Well, this is a legal thriller. And uh, it's really in its first for first sight, you think it's kind of a familiar kind of genre structure, you know, that it's two lawyers, a defense lawyer who's played by Jodie Foster, uh, who's an old hand and a, and a liberal through and through. And then the prosecution lawyer played by Benedict Cumberbatch, none other than Dr. Strange himself. <laughs> um, and uh, he's a he's a, a Republican Marine who's now a now a, a government lawyer. He's been asked to prosecute this case. And at the heart of it is the prisoner himself, played by a wonderful French Algerian actor called Tahar Rahim, who is a prisoner in Guantanamo Bay, accused of being part of the 9-11 conspiracy, of having recruited several of the 9-11 uh, uh, um, uh, hijackers. And um, the story really follows these three characters and how this, how this uh, particular um, case impacts their lives. And for you, the the story, it's impactful, especially in the times that we're living in. And Kevin, what was the biggest challenge in trying to wrap your head around all of the roles and in all of the nuances, if you will? Well, I wanted to make a film which wasn't, you know, politically partisan. That wasn't like, you know, a film that Republicans were going to say, oh, that's, you know, that's just liberal propaganda. <laughs> and that liberals weren't going to weren't going to say, oh, that's a that's a, a, a pro Bush film or whatever. Right. You know, this is a film about human beings. And that's sort of what I wanted to achieve. I wanted to humanize everybody, including the prisoner. And we have the perspective of this uh, Muslim prisoner. Uh, in Guantanamo, and we get to see what it was really like inside that inside that prison. And um, I think it was getting the balance between all those three stories, those three different perspectives. That was the that was the challenge of this, especially when you've got such brilliant actors. Um, and I shouldn't, you know, I, I should also mention Shailene Woodley, who's a you know wonderful mm. young young actor uh, who's also in the movie. And um, you know, the, 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 this the, 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 having almost too many stars and figuring out how do we how do we give everybody the time that they need for this story to really blossom and for you this time around how much different is the landscape on promotions this time around and how much tech savvy did you have to how much technology did you have to learn 
That's a good question. Well, you know what? This has obviously been the worst period ever for releasing a movie. We, 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 we released this in the middle of the pandemic. It came out in a few theaters um, like three months ago in the US um, and it's opened in a couple of other territories. But, you know, I think, I think, I think the most theaters we've had has been in, um, uh, in, in uh, Korea, which wasn't where I expected we'd be, <laughs> we'd be opening uh, to our most, the- most number of theaters. But, it, you know, it's, um, all the promotion has been done here from my desk in London, England, where I'm sitting uh, in front of a computer where, you know, like a lot of people have been sitting in front of computers as well for the last year or so. Now, Kevin, what do you think uh, what do you think are the positives from folks taking in movies streaming wise and downloading? How do you think that's going to affect the industry as things open back up, if you will? I think people are desperate to get out and I think they're desperate to experience, you know, live shows, so theater or music, but also to go and have a kind of public experience at the, at the theater. For me, you know, speaking as, as, as somebody who's loved movies my whole life, watching something on uh, the small screen is great. And I do it all the time. I'm doing it every night, but it's not the same experience as watching it on the big screen. It's not as emotionally impactful. I don't think anyone can really argue otherwise. When you are watching at home, you're in charge of that screen. It sits in the corner. You you can answer your phone. You can make yourself a coffee. You can grab a drink. You know, you're not fully engaged uh, in the same way. When you're in a movie theater, that screen owns you. You know, you are there captive and you've got you to gotta go through what the filmmaker wants you to go through. It's a very, very different thing. And I, I think that experience, people miss it and they will go back to it. Whether or not, Obviously, all the theaters survive. I don't know. And Kevin, as you watch a film for the first time after being behind the scenes, what are the, what are the big things that grab a hold of you of, of the works that you've done whenever you have the chance to see them the first time? Well, you know, whenever you watch your own movies at the uh, at the theater, and I only ever do it right when it first, you know, when, I, when I've just finished it, I take it to a film festival or on the opening night, I'll go and see it, is just that you 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 seeing it with a bunch of other people and you start to see it through their eyes and the movie plays differently and things that you thought were not funny people laugh at points in the movie where you thought you know oh this was so tense this might be the moment that audiences you see them looking at their watch there's things that you know you're never quite certain it's an interactive experience going to the theater that's the thing it's and it's never quite the same twice you know you know, you hear actors in theater say, you know, that was a good show. That was a bad show. But actually the same thing happened with movies. In my experience, you can have a good showing and a bad showing. It depends on the mood in the house when the, when the lights go down. And, and when at the end of the day, is it that live presentation and the, the feedback from that that matters most to you as opposed to the critics or the, uh, the, the award presenters, if you will? Yeah, I think that, you know, what the most important thing for any I guess work of art like this is that you is that you know you entertain people, you engage people, you interest people. I think this movie in particular is a movie where you know it's it's tremendously tense and suspenseful, but also at the end of it, you 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 want to know more. And I, a lot of people I know have said to me, "Oh my god, I went and spent like two hours looking on Wikipedia after finishing the movie because I just wanted to know so much more about this subject and about these individuals." That's awesome. And again, the uh, Mauritanian is available now. And uh, Kevin, I do want to make sure and let our folks know where they can find more information, not only about the movie, but everything you've got going social media wise as well. Well, you know what? I'm a dinosaur. I don't do social media. <laughs> I'm the last. I'm the last director with no social media account. That's awesome. Well, well, Kevin, uh, folks can check that movie out anywhere they get their downloads. And Kevin, I truly do appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule and looking forward to spending more time with the movie myself. Great. Nice to talk to you. Bye bye. Thanks again for joining us for this 73rd episode in season two of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, a question, anything else you'd like to know, you can hit me up on the contact page at gqwithcam.com. You can also find me on all the socials, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at gqwithcam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, you can visit our merch store. We've got hoodies, shirts, mugs, tumblers, stickers, and more, gqwithcam.com forward slash shop. You can also make a one-time donation at buymeacoffee.com forward slash GQ with Cam. 
And if you do have a special guest idea, email me, gqwithcam at gmail.com. Thanks again to our good friend Brandon Allen for coming up with our theme music. We're going to let him play us out and hope you guys have a great rest of your Tuesday.